Good morning, everybody. Um, I really appreciate the words of Sikander and, and John uh, that brings us all together this morning. I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the invitation and it is a real pleasure and honor to, uh, to speak with you. Little did we think back in London in the mid 1970s that decades later that Sikander, Ajim Khan and John Healy and myself would meet virtually to discuss architecture and to share our experiences. I agreed to speak to you today, uh, as is mentioned, because of old friendships, because as architectural and planning colleagues, we are bound together as members of a deeply meaningful uh, series of professions which affect the daily lives of people. When Shelley McNamara and I, as curators of the 2018 Venice Biennale, Architecture Biennale, wrote that manifesto that, that uh, Sikander kindly referred to, we did choose the title Free Space because we wanted to focus on architecture uh, of space, not on architecture as object. The quotes that Sikander has chosen is interesting from our A4, very short sheet of, of manifesto, but what there are others, little phrases, which I'll refer to now as well, that architecture focuses on, that free space focuses on architecture's ability to provide free <clears throat> and additional spatial gifts to those who use it and on its ability to address the unspoken wishes of strangers. And I think what is an incredible privilege about being architects and planners is that there are many strangers who have nothing to do with the making of projects, but will be affected by them immediately, but also in times to come. And the, the, the references that Sikandra has about uh, in free space becoming, describes a generosity of spirit and a sense of humanity at the core of architecture's agenda, focusing on the quality of space itself. So the Free Space Manifesto was interesting for Shelley and I to write because we were writing down, if you like, a litany of value systems. And so we hope that it's something that's of help uh, to kind of remind ourselves. It's not that you get up every morning and read the manifesto as a kind of a, uh, as a, kind of a prayerful introduction to architectural design, but it does describe the, the, the ability of architecture to reach out. And one of the most important thing, and John uh, referred to it there in terms of uh, environment and climate change. During the, the preparation for the Biennale, we, we chose the, uh, an embedded title is that we see the earth as client. And that brings with it, if you like, long lasting, long -lasting responsibilities. That, but that architecture is uh, uh, such an important discipline that that's why as the older we get, we realize how, mo how even more important uh, it, it is than when we were younger. I am struck by the current population of, of Pakistan being about 250 million, which is enormous. We live in a country of less than 5 million. But by 2050, according to the United Nations projections, it will be 380 million. So you will be the third largest country uh, uh, in the world. And for us, what's interesting is that since 2018, 55% of the world live in urban areas. And because of the scale of building, we've begun ourselves to use the term that architecture is the new geography because of the scale of building. I'd like to say that architecture matters, that people and colleagues matter, that what is necessary and what is recommended is a belief in architecture that lasts a lifetime. That a belief that's difficult to work sometimes, and, but it is difficult work that is worthwhile, that it has consequence and that it is meaningful at a cultural level. Today, I will speak about nine projects under the title of work in progress. All of these projects have been won by competition. I will discuss the layers that we in Grafton Architects try to unpeel. We're inventing and transforming need. Architecture is a response to human need. We like to give each project, uh, if you like, the possibility of celebrating, first of all, its use, the place, the climate, the culture and materiality. I will speak about older projects. 
I will speak about recent projects and I'll try and state, if you like, what we have learned, what we learn from and what we value. Of the nine projects, it's just interesting because of the questions that uh, Sikander had sent. Um, of, the, of the, when we uh, are, how will I describe it? Of the various projects I'll talk about today, there are colleagues in the countries that we build with whom we form relationships. These are local architects. When we built UTEC in, in uh, Lima in Peru, through the kindness of other architects re uh, recommending, we found Shell architects. So Alejandro Shell and Rafael Mispreta worked with us as the local architects because we live here in Ireland and our project was in Lima, Peru on the other side of the globe. When we were doing our two French projects, we luckily worked with an incredible architect, Philippe Vigneux of Vigneux Zilio from Toulouse in France. Mm -hmm. And that relationship between architects where the kind of lack of ego and uh, uh, importance of collaboration is really strong, is really very important to make a building. Also, when we're doing a project in the United States uh, and we're in, in Arkansas and we're working with a local firm, Moda Studio, and in Korea, uh, we're working with a group based in Seoul called Space Group. And in Dublin, we're working with Shafri Associates. So the whole issue of collaboration is really very important. The human interaction, just like meeting of Sikander and John and myself decades later, that the relationship between humans and the shared values are really something that need to be, uh, uh, need, need to be described. And my first image with you this morning is that I'd really like to acknowledge that uh, I am your guest this morning, but I am part of a team. And that the teamwork, this is our, this was a wonderful occasion. This was uh, last year in London, we received the gold medal for the, from the RIBA. And what was amazing was just to celebrate with our colleagues. These are our architects within Grafton Architects, all of whom work incredibly hard, who work diligently, are highly talented, and their commitment and belief in architecture is really what uh, sustains uh, sustains our work. So it's more like a community of shared spirits than a than a than a business proposition. Let 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 us say. So I'll begin. Our first project outside Ireland was the result of winning a competition uh, in two thousand and two. We had been building in Ireland for twenty four years before that, but we were invited as one of ten architectural practice to participate in this competition for a new building for Bocconi University in the wonderful North Italian city of Milan. And what uh, this drawing I think is important for students uh, up on the top right hand side is the sketch which holds this 65,000 square meter project together. It was for a thousand offices uh, for administration and for, uh, for professors. It was uh, on a site of 180 meters long by 80 meters. It, <clears throat> so our strategy, these two paper models uh, on the right hand side is a one to 500 paper model where we organize the offices like raised courtyards to the sky, allowing sunlight deep into the, into the section and corrupting the ground uh, in putting the, the larger uh, collective rooms so that they reach up for the sky and for the light as well. And structure that important uh, uh, a companion of architecture, every 25 meters, we spanned the, the, the structure 25 meters to these 3.6 diaphragm walls, and we hung the offices from above, liberating the, the soffit below so that the space between the free space, the void, would become, uh, if you like, the joining space between the two levels. On the left-hand side here of my image, we have the city of Milan, a busy road in this position, a quieter road. So we delayed the, uh, if you like, the entrance, not bringing it in in the main uh, thoroughfare, bringing it down the quiet, <laughs> delaying the entrance into, into this point and dropping down five meters below, positioning the great hall, the room for a thousand people on the junction between the city and the uh, 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 and the university, we had 
positioned in the beginning of a competition, we'd put the aula, the big hall, deep in the lower plan. But we felt that the building was not connecting to the city. We felt that by placing the grand room on that junction, we connected the city and uh, had a lantern and a, and a combination of the wishes of the university to be read in the city. So here we have the plan every 25 meters, the bars of offices, the voids of light down below. And we developed with a window manufacturer, Perma Stelisa, these shingles, these glass shingles that gave us both privacy and light. And every office has a, an opening window. And in these days of COVID where natural ventilation is recommended and of that, that we have embedded in our buildings that the opening window is something of a, a, a if you like, a. a a recommended, this was long before COVID in 2002. In this drawing also, you see this bar of building, which is like a shield. These are all the group meeting rooms uh, on, the, on the side street. Here we have the section of the great room, the, the big hall. There's a 22 uh, meter cantilever, which is the structural uh, uh, projection of the upper part of the room. Each of these, uh, these are like periscopes bringing natural daylight into the great hall. So it's never a, a, a closed down black box if you're spending your day in that space. But for us, the symbolic connection and the, the real connection between the, the, this eight meter high uh, clear glass wall linking the citizens of Milan into the, the lower body of this, uh, of this university. So when you're also a, a, a lucky student or professor within this institution, you're aware of your relationship to the city of Milan. So this space also for us, sometimes in a project, something happens that make a, 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 an experience better than you imagined. And for us uh, to stand underneath this uh, 22 meter cantilever, you have this sense of gravity being held, of your poise between the forces, the incredible natural forces uh, of structure. Sometime later then, this is a, a project which, a competition which we did in uh, Lima and Peru. Now Lima is a desert city. Uh, it's on the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we, um, <coughs> excuse me, this was a new university uh, for, uh, for engineering. And when we looked at the site, what was amazing for us was one, that it's 12 meters, or sorry, 12 degrees from the equator. It should be really hot, but because of a current coming up from uh, Antarctica called the von Humboldt current, it keeps the temperature of Lima in around the uh, 20 degrees Celsius. So it's, it's an unusual situation. And this fog develops, which is really uh, amazing architecturally because fog refracts the light and intensifies it. I won't talk about von Humboldt, the, the person after whom that current is related, but von Humboldt was an incredible character. Uh, it, you could have uh, 10 lectures on, on that extraordinary uh, human being. Um, but for us doing this competition, these little drawings, and, and I would, um, I suppose I would encourage, uh, especially with schools of architecture, that the little scratches or the DNA or the first thoughts that, that within the, 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 uh, the, the thinking of architects, that it begins the story of a project because each project is trying to find the DNA, the inherent possibility within each project. So here's a sketch of the Pacific of the 40 meter high uh, cliffs that protect the city of Lima from the, uh, you can see them here in the photograph below. The site was a 350 meter long valley uh, coming in from the sea and the brief was for a new school of engineering on a very tight site with large scale uh, laboratories, medium sized laboratories and smaller uh, classrooms. So what we did was there was a busy motorway uh, th that ran along the site. So we built a sectional idea where we if you like make a shoulder to the busy motorway and we cascade the uh, the the, uh, the the building towards the residential on the on the eastern on the eastern side, but we use the roofs of the bigger rooms down below as outdoor garden spaces uh, for the students. So this paper model on, of uh, at, at one is to five hundred uh, on the uh, on this image is showing it the roof cascading down, providing uh, uh, outdoor space uh, for the students within the university. 
And I show you these two images because we presented them at the uh, David Chipperfield's uh, Biennale in, in, in Venice uh, called Common Ground. And for us, when these two images were being uh, put up on by the workmen in, in Venice, they asked, why are you putting up two images of the same thing? And what is extraordinary is that this image here is of Skellig Michel, which is an island off the coast of Ireland, which from the 8th to about the 11th century was a hermitage. And the spaces are built uh, with uh, dry stone walling and the little gardens of the, of the monks, of the hermits, clinging on to the side of this landscape uh, uh, to ensure their survival. It's intimate and the vast Atlantic Ocean in which this island is. And on this side here, you have uh, Machu Picchu, the amazing 15th century city of the Incas. And what is extraordinary about the, their gift of uh, craftsmanship with, uh, with stone, you can't get a knife into the uh, uh, three-dimensional socketing of their stone, but also these intimate gardens, which are the survival high in the, in the, uh, in the Andes. So this is really about the intimate and the vast where there's no intermediate scale. So for us, when we were designing for uh, Peruvian students, that we felt that bringing in the intimate gardens of the Incas to the roof of their uh, new university was translating, if you like, history, but also making it useful in contemporary world, not in a kind of a only referential way, but in a useful way. So here we have, <coughs> excuse me, I love this image up on the top uh, corner. There were 900 workmen uh, making this building at enormous speed in the wonderful construction industry of, of Peru. In the fog, you can see them building, building the building. On the bottom here, you see the, the uh, working uh, section where if you can see these here, because uh, Lima is on a, a, a fault line, this is the, the, the parking area down below. Above it are these huge 1.5 meter springs because the building actually has to respond to seismic uh, action. I hope I never experience it, but we have worked with wonderful engineers in, in Peru. So these are seismic isolator, isolators on which the building sits. And then we protect against the high uh, sun angle. These are, uh, if you like, protections. And what was important for us building in this a particular climate in a country we did not know, but one thing they wanted a university, we asked the question, if you have this particular kind of uh, climate within <clears throat> on the earth, could we harness this specific climate in the city of Lima to invent a new vertical campus with circulation outside shaded from the sun where we could interweave landscape and open air circulation for as much as possible and only the rooms <coughs> only the rooms that had to be internal would be internalized could we could we make a university that was an arena for learning? So here we have the section of the sun, it's in, in the valley, protecting from the high level sun. We have the students in what is really a, a carved a carved mountain. So here you see the plan, it's like a, a banana or a boomerang and every 20 meters we're shifting the plan as it moves along. And spatially what is really interesting is because of the slight curve of the actual site, you don't get, uh, like in Bocconi, the continuous space, but you get this shifting like in a medieval city, which is actually worked out in a very uh, beautiful way for us. So on the, this photograph then describes the interweaving of landscape, the, uh, the interconnection of, uh, of landscape uh, with circulation, viewing into the laboratories. So what you get is, uh, if you like, an idea of university campus where if you're a student of one discipline, you might be walking along here and view in and become fascinated by the, uh, if you like, the research going on in a particular laboratory. So for us, it's not just place, it's not just use, it's also culture and, uh, and, and education. We did this competition, <clears throat> this is a building just recently finished uh, not far from uh, from Paris in a place called Saclay, which is a, um, it's a plateau uh, where the French government decided, a bit like Silicon Valley in the United States, uh, that they would build, if you like, on a plateau, uh, a combination of high uh, 
uh, universities uh, ov over time. And when we went to do this competition, it was really agricultural fields. So we needed an idea that was both self-sufficient before buildings arrived and also would be part of a network when buildings did arrive. And this little photograph down here of this yellow stone was something very important for us. As we stood on these agricultural fields and knew that they would be transformed over time, we brought back to Ireland from France this little stone, it's in the size of your hand, of this kind of yellow ochre of the piece of history of the geology of this particular place. Also because it was for a huge number of uh, research uh, offices, uh, we wanted to understand the measure. And these drawings here, this is uh, uh, Paris uh, um, uh, Royal in Paris, this incredibly beautiful composite building, which has a series of courtyards and very thin enclosures. The second drawing is an absolutely marvelous building in Milan called Ospitali Maggiore. It was built in the 1400s as a hospital, a marvelous building. You could have 10 lectures on that building alone. In terms of section, it's dealing with <coughs> fresh air, it's dealing with sewage. It, but it's what's amazing is built in the 1400s, it's still in use. It's, the, it's a un, part of the university, uh, the Department of Law and still functions. And in terms of sustainability, if you build a building in the 1400s and it's still working in 2021, I would say that that wins sustainability hands down. The next image, the drawing is of Trinity College, the first, uh, the front uh, 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 courts uh, of Trinity College. And for us, we walk through that under normal circumstances, we would be walking through that campus every day to get the measure of the building that we were beginning to design for this competition. And the top drawing and the model are, are it's the, excuse me, <coughs> the model is a, a one to 500 uh, for the competition. And essentially what we were doing was making a series of courtyards where you enter from the north, you have uh, four courtyards uh, and a big courtyard because part of the competition was that there was a requirement for, uh, for um, uh, 100 uh, trees to grow uh, as part of the, the master planning idea, a very beautiful master plan, which it's of the whole, uh, the whole of Saclay. So what we, what we did, this is a, the ground floor plan. We placed all the common rooms uh, on the ground floor plan. You enter from the north into a, a front court you pass the cafe uh, here, you view through into the large court with the hundred trees, you enter the building and you come to a pinwheel. This is like a, a, a center of gravity of circulation and you move then to the, to the various auditoria and the teaching rooms uh, at this level. And you're, uh, there's also a transparency to view into the various courtyards uh, that, are, uh, that are part of, of our proposition. And this section shows the, the trees in real ground. And each of the offices has a view, this thin bar, going back to the issue of the, the uh, having an opening window, that offices, we like to design buildings where offices or rooms have uh, access to, to the outside. So the section here shows each office either viewing out beyond the campus or into a courtyard, that you have a parking under this uh, part here, the, you enter and you have this center of gravity of this vertical space and a ramp that brings you up to the library, which is positioned symbolically uh, at the uh, core of this project where it views into the natural landscape with the hundred trees and back into the whole organization. And in the image above this photograph, you're brought up the stairs, you see this ramp that brings you along and in the distance, you can see the, uh, the position uh, of the library. Here, going back to that little piece of stone that I showed you that we had in our hands, we chose that we would use what we call vertical contours. And these uh, uh, precast concrete pieces with, uh, uh, which, which define uh, the offices and frame the view beyond the building. You enter into the front court, past the cafe, looking into the trees, which will mature obviously over time and enter into this first courtyard. So over time, these trees will mature and become part of the inner landscape of this, of this project. Another, the second project, uh, which we won by competition in France, is in the absolutely beautiful city of Toulouse. 
Toulouse is a, a, a city, first of all, there were Celts, then there were Romans. It has an incredible history. This beautiful uh, uh, map, which is like a broken heart uh, of the uh, ancient city with the magnificent uh, river Garonne. So the Garonne uh, flows through it. It also has the Canal de Midi, which is these incredible uh, canal structures uh, uh, littered throughout France. And the site was extraordinary. If you set it Sikander for your students, they wouldn't believe that the, this many things would happen at one point. So you have a, a Romanesque church a five meter high medieval brick wall, which has a gap in it and the junction of the canals and the river besides a, a public uh, space. So this was the competition. We did not know Toulouse. We went to Toulouse and we are like uh, architectural detectives. We look at history, we try to absorb history, but we also try to transform it. And the, the, uh, Toulouse is known as the Ville Rose, which is the, the, the kind of rose uh, city, which is really because of the brick. The brick gives the air and the bounce light this absolutely beautiful quality. And we looked at the, the, the churches with their fantastic buttresses, these structures leaning up against building. But also what we looked at was the, were these fantastic courtyards. Because of the climate and location of Toulouse, these open air courtyards are absolutely beautiful with, with circulation. And we also looked at the, the medieval, uh, uh, or sorry, the Romanesque church. And here is the, this is our competition collage where we were taking uh, cloisters and surface and buttresses and trying to transform them into a, contemporary, uh, into a contemporary piece. So here is the plan. This was a research building in the break of that medieval of, of uh, brick wall at this point. And we wanted to continue the wall in a sense. And we used the, the six fire, uh, fire um, escape stairs. Uh, not in a kind of a functional way, but in a way that they did a job, but also they held the form of the building. So they are the outer crust. And going back to that courtyard, we said, wouldn't it be wonderful to make a 21st century courtyard, which was open to the sky, which let air through and became the heart of this, uh, uh, this community. And all of the offices face in various directions and all of them uh, are, have their surface bent to protect them uh, from the sun. And we positioned all the, the bigger rooms, these, uh, uh, if you like, um, uh, um, seminar and, and uh, conference rooms as like boulders on the edge with gaps between them to frame the view out into this beautiful city of, of Toulouse. And we would say that one of architecture's role is to heighten your awareness of where you are, whether you're in Milan, whether you're in Peru, or whether you're in Toulouse, that architecture's responsibility is to, uh, if you like, enliven or to formulate that relationship uh, in built form. So here we have the, the plans on the base embedded in the ground, moving up, becoming like a butterfly, opening itself up to the surrounding uh, uh, context. And then we have the sky cloister, which is the, the route that connects the fire routes at the upper level, which also acts as a framing uh, device. You, so you see our section of the sky cloister, the carved out uh, interior of this building. So you here have the, uh, the building at night, you see the, 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 the buttresses of the fire stairs acting as the circulation and the, the, the sky cloister framing the main entrance to the building. Here we have, there's a slight rise as you enter to the center, 600 millimeter of a ramp. You're looking at the main, the, the hollow out, you're able to see the framed sky. So each of the offices have views uh, to the internal uh, vertical courtyard or to the surround. And here you have the, the brick, the pleated wall, which protects from the sun, but also, so each facade is modified depending on its relationship to orientation and, and angle. And this is what I, what I mean about, here are two students who are waiting to go into the auditorium. You're in the building, but down below is the, the cafe, the, the, uh, the terrace, the medieval wall, the canal, the Garonne, and the major buildings of Toulouse being framed and highlighted. So it brings the, so architecture's ability to move out towards space, but also to bring space into your awareness means that when you're up uh, and in a building, that that connection is, is heightened. So the building sits with its medieval wall, two students casually having a conversation between the city and the inner space. And the materiality, 
What's amazing about architecture as a, as a discipline is that it has function, it has, uh, it has uh, so many things to deal with, but also in the end, it is a real thing, it is materiality. So here we have the medieval wall and we came as closely as we could to this wall to continue our building as a, as a modified wall. And normally in France, what's happening at the moment is that they use these plaquettes, which are like tiles stuck onto buildings. But we wanted to find real bricks because the sensation of reality and the realness of something is something that's communicated to, to people instinctively. So we found about an hour from Toulouse, a factory that still made bricks in the same way, really continuing from Roman times. So we found bricks that were the same proportion, the same uh, uh, kind of uh, beautiful color. And we, we found, uh, obviously we made a mortar. So we went as closely as we could uh, to, the, to the medieval wall to transform it uh, into, uh, into modern use. So that building now sits uh, in its context in this, as I say, this beautiful city uh, as part of its, uh, its contemporary uh, uh, history. Quickly, just looking at, uh, this is uh, Kingston University in, in uh, just south of the city of London on the River Thames. And Kingston University held a competition. This nearby is the, is the, is the university and they wanted a new, what they called townhouse. This was really interesting because the two components of this new townhouse was a library and, and dance department. Now, acoustically, they're at the end of each spectrum. Libraries are normally quiet and dance, especially urban dance, has some unbelievable level of decibels. So they're normally, uh, if you like, kept poles apart. But for us, what was wonderful was that this was an opportunity to have difference uh, joined together. And also it was an opportunity for the university to connect to the, uh, the rather damaged, Kingston has been rather damaged as a place because the road engineers have really since the 60s have cut through this, uh, this, uh, this part of, uh, of, of Kingston uh, really to the human detriment of, of, of pleasure. So what we, what we did really was to make what we call a warehouse of ideas. We used a, a frame structure to allow us to separate and to join the uses. And we also wrapped the, the, uh, the, the building on the south, on the, on the, on the, uh, the west and the north that we would uh, have this uh, colonnade, which uh, acted as escape routes, but also provided outdoor terraces. So in the sections here, we also embed, it was about movement that you would move very easily up through the building, that also that the main space, which was the, would not be a black box, but would be something that would be a, a, a democratic space that had a, a number of uses. So this was, what's really interesting is this, uh, uh, the, the, this Greek bulletarian here, the, the, this was something really important in ancient Greece, this was housed the Council of Citizens, and it was a, a, for a, a democratic city space. And working with the university, which had an amazing policy in terms of education, uh, they agreed that instead of a black box, that this would become uh, the heart of the building from the foyer. So you've got the colonnade to, the, to uh, Kingston, uh, to the bus stops outside. They wanted to encourage not only students, but also the general public to feel that university buildings welcomed them as well. So you enter in, there's dance here, there's the, uh, the, the what we call the, the, the courtyard. And as you move up through the various uh, parts of the building, it's about interconnection and interlocking. So this is our uh, democratic space. So you enter, uh, you have the library, which is acoustically separated from here, but visually connected. You can close it off and you have other areas so that dancers are able to see the library and the library is able to see the dancers. And you have this uh, semi uh, indoor outdoor space uh, feeling within this acoustically uh, contained space. And these two images describe the university's connection to the city. On the right hand side, you have the uh, the, the road, the busy road with the spot stop, you have the colonnade inviting strangers as well as uh, uh, students, those privileged to be students of this institution. You have these terraces which link you back to where you are. You have, which will in the future, here we have um, 
uh, uh, metal wires over the landscape to, to in include landscape. Because from this point up here, you can actually look across the, the Thames to see Hampton Court, one of the beautiful palaces uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of London. And on the, the left-hand side here, you see you're inside in the foyer, in the space of the, the, the courtyard, looking through the foyer back out to the street. So this relationship between inside and outside, blurring the boundaries, making you aware that you are a citizen of the earth is something that we like to, uh, to, to build into, into our projects. Another project which is on site in, uh, uh, in London is for the uh, London School of Economics. It's on one really beautiful space, Lincoln's Inn's Fields. Uh, it, the competition was for 55 meters of uh, surface onto this beautiful uh, common uh, uh, space and across the square is the beautiful uh, house which is now a, a museum and open to the public of John Sohn, that great architect uh, and uh, it's really uh, worth uh, a visit and when to spend some time in John uh, Sohn's uh, building. Uh, great architect and, and teacher, but for us it was also a big challenge to be building across the square from an architect uh, uh, whose work we admire. So this is a, comp a competition for um, uh, Marshall is in fact one of the, uh, this institute, we placed the, the Marshall Institute on the roof of this building, so you'd have these amazing views over the city of London, that it's essentially a, a university building with uh, teaching <coughs> facilities um, and office and research, and also below ground, an enormous uh, sports uh, complex uh, dug deep into the section of the building. And I'd like to <clears throat> maybe just pause for a moment in terms of uh, the relationship between structure and architecture. And we use this term in dialogue with gravity. As I said, that sense of under in Bocconi, that 22 meter uh, a cantilevered uh, hall above you, having a sense uh, in Lima, the sense of the structure every 20 uh, meters. And here, what we, this is a, a, a drawing of the structure. So up here is the relationship to Lincoln's in fields. And the wonderful thing about the London School of Economics, it's a university, but it's also part of the city. It's really city streets. It's a whole series of Warren of streets. And this is really a diagram. The gray box under on that drawing is the big sports hall down below underneath. And we wanted a, a type of structure that would bring you from the public space into the streetscape and be able to absorb uh, the, the spanning of the big space down below. So it's really to avoid transfer structures. We have used a series of of tree-like structures that move up and get smaller and smaller for the offices on the upper floor. And the image here is of a building which is inspirational for this, uh, uh, this tree-like structural idea, which is uh, uh, Lincoln's Inn's Chapel. And what's very beautiful about this chapel is that the undercroft, which is public, has these uh, tree-like structures that holds an enormous room above it. And so the structure is telling you there's something great above, but this is open to the public. And we took this, if you look at these uh, workmen here on site, the scale of a human being there, that these tree-like structures are really holding up the, uh, the upper part of the London School of Economics. And during the competition, this was our drawing, describing the, the public space, the grand room, which links, there's Lincoln's Inns uh, fields out there in the distance, uh, the ground slightly slopes as it goes down towards the River Thames. So you get this gentle sloping on the floor and you get this democratic space where the students of LSE and the citizens of London, uh, if you like, can transverse this great hall. And educationally and spatially, so the structure helping to define the space, but also educationally, that there's a link to the upper levels, that when you're teaching that it's not so separated, it's not like a kind of a, a layered a piece of where things are separated, it's about joining. And over here you see this staircase, which is really bringing students from this great space up to the upper one. And this is now under construction. So here we have uh, the, the staircase under construction, you see the 
uh, if you like the tree-like structures, making their presence felt. So the structure isn't hidden, but it's something that you feel and that you, uh, that you see and that you can touch. So this is the staircase which will bring students in conversation up to the first uh, major teaching level. In terms of, <coughs> excuse me, this was, uh, this is a project in Arkansas and uh, Arkansas is uh, in the central um, uh, of the United States. And what was really interesting for us uh, in this competition was that the Faye Jones School of Architecture in Fayetteville, it's in the state of Arkansas, they held a competition for a new center for timber research called the Anthony Timberland Center. And trees are worthy of our deep respect and a sustainable building material, uh, we need to do deep research into its possibilities. And there's a, a beautiful quote from uh, the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran. He talks about trees. He says, trees are poems that the earth writes upon the sky. So it's a very beautiful thing of just seeing them, especially this time of year here, which is before the leaves arrive. And Faye Jones on the right hand side is a very beautiful chapel by Faye Jones, who, uh, if you like, was an architect from Arkansas uh, from 1921. Uh, he died in 2004. But Thorn Crown Chapel is set among the oaks and pines and maple uh, in, in Arkansas. And it's uh, said to be inspired by Saint Chapelle, the Gothic, the beautiful Gothic church uh, in, in Paris. So we uh, decided to do this competition. Uh, and we uh, thought about buildings in the United States that we find fascinating, this really, you know, this coal uh, building, timber, kind of no-nonsense um, combination of, of spaces uh, satisfying uh, their particular needs, but also just in terms of the climate, like in, in, in Peru, like in, uh, in, in, other, in Toulouse, that we look at the, the physical properties of the place that we are dealing with. And the climate in Fayetteville it, we were surprised actually has rainfall all through through the year and we thought about a response to this uh, finding a practical response to the to the downpours so this is these are the beginnings of our architectural search these kind of sketches looking at the functions seeing the size getting the measure of it so really we're what we're uh, th the main element was a large or is a large fabrication shop so really what we were saying was that we would, the fabrication shop obviously for a timber uh, research in a university would be ground-based and the other pieces would be part of the town structure. But we'd make this canopy of light that would both protect the working space for the fabrication shop, but other, also educationally link the rooms. Um, I suppose these, these uh, models, some of the very crude drawings are also an encouragement for students that, that sometimes even in a very crude drawing is the beginning of an idea, it's the birth of a creative uh, motion. So, so uh, I, I, we really love these kind of scratchy drawings because they're the kind of uh, thinking mind and thinking hand. So it's really an encouragement to make even a bit like, um, is it um, uh, uh, Samuel Beckett who says, you know, fail and fail again, you know, keep, keep doing things because in the doing something, something is found. So what we did was we took these, uh, the, the, the idea of this kind of blanket of roof, we took the, we made this uh, proposal for these kind of canoes, these water canoes to capture, uh, could capture the water, to bring light, northern light into this space and to drape the, uh, the, um, the, the building with the, these water. Uh, so we'd have about 24 meters and then eight meter cantilevers for these uh, water containers, these enormous uh, gutters. And the other thing which was important about this, this particular building is that Arkansas, they're really trying to develop their timber industry. And it wasn't that we would take the kind of flat pack idea of timber being uh, uh, one thing, like a kind of a modified concrete, but that we would look at the range of structural uh, uh, possibilities for timber itself. So here we have uh, the, the purple, this very crude drawing, but describing 
white column oaks, we'd have hickory and pecan butterlint beams, we'd have glue lamb beams, we, these are the gutters, then we'd use smaller pieces to make these smaller trusses, and that we'd have a, a queen post truss. And we were working with uh, 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 wonderful um, uh, engineers, and Mark Whitby of Whitby Wood, developing these huge uh, 1.2 meter size uh, uh, timber timber structures. And this image is up on one of the galleries viewing down into this uh, educational in educational space. And th this is a, a, a cross section showing the fabrication shop, the auditorium, and moving up with the teaching levels, but also the introduction of a, a queen post truss, which is a, an amazing uh, structural uh, uh, ability of timber. So we want to uh, have this in order to, to free up the auditorium, which is hanging a bit like the, the library in, in, uh, in uh, Saclay, where the library is positioned or the auditorium is positioned at the symbolic junction between the teaching and the sharing. So that's the, the, the auditorium uh, position. The, the building is at the end of a, of a, of a, of a block, a university teaching block, a busy road, not so busy, service and enter into the courtyard. The fabrication shop is on the, on the lower level. And what we wanted to do was that we wanted from the pavement, from the sidewalk, that people could see into this fabrication shop and be able to, uh, if you like, participate in the, uh, uh, in the uh, or observe uh, student work. So here we have um, in the competition view entering the, uh, along the side. Here is a view of the working uh, uh, courtyard below. And then here it is really <clears throat> from the competition, you're on the, uh, the fabrication floor, excuse me. <clears throat> you're here, you see the window out to the main, the main street. So the general public can view in from here and from the side street. You see the, the big columns of, uh, of oak uh, along here, which are these enormous uh, pieces, which hold these canoes, these glue lamb, uh, containers of water. And here you see the Queen Post Truss, which is really uh, uh, the, the uh, large scale uh, uh, structure that is able to hang the, uh, the auditorium. And here we see uh, from you're out on the side road, you're able to see into this uh, educational facility, the Anthony uh, Timberland Centre. And the building, um, if you like, will we'll stand on, this is the Martin Luther King uh, Junior Boulevard, one of the main uh, avenues uh, in, uh, in Fayetteville, and you see the building uh, uh, being able to uh, participate in this new uh, block from the university, it's the satellite block from the university, but also to be able to, to celebrate the, the, uh, the, the variety and capacity the, the smell, the texture uh, that timber can, can actually actually bring. Um, this is a, a competition that we, um, that we won uh, in, uh, in the Republic of, uh, of, of Korea. And this, this beautiful uh, map from the, the 14, uh, early 1400s is one of the first uh, of, of Asia. And we just thought this was incredibly beautiful to see uh, the, 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 the history of, of, this, um, uh, of, of, the, of this country. And when we were looking at the particular site, uh, one of the, this is the university uh, here in Kongju, uh, the city, and the site for the new uh, building was here. And it was a very unusual brief because it's a boarding school for teenagers with intellectual disabilities. So this is a place where they come and live for three years and they're trained in various uh, um, disciplines in order that they can have jobs and that they can participate in society. And one of the, the first things that, uh, that we feel important is to look at the deep history to bring it into contemporary, contemporary life. And in our research, there were three particular things that caught our, uh, um, uh, uh, our, our attention. And one was the uh, uh, historically the, the mountain fortress. Uh, the next one was the, uh, if you like, the Shouwang, which was the the institution, the the, uh, the courtyard institution. And then there was the Hanok, which was the the Korean house. So these were uh, pieces of history which we looked at in depth. 
and also the Korean value of nature, that nature is a, a really an important uh, uh, force uh, in their lives. And looking at the, the institution, if you like, what, what we found very beautiful, not just in plan, where you get a, a precinct that you enter, you have the more public, the, uh, the institution gets more and more private as you in, embed into the plan. But also in section, you see this rising, the, uh, the learned territory, which is here, and then the more sacred territory on the interior. And this beautiful photograph where you see the first building, this guy, where you enter below and underneath, and then you have the scholars being in a position to view down. So this sense of section and this sense of connection was something we found really very beautiful. So we began this competition by looking at the Hanuk. And because it was a residential, it was to be a residential school for these teenagers, we looked at the Hanuk, which has this lovely central space and smaller spaces of it. And we built our residential dormitories around the idea of the hammock, of the Hanuk. And then we placed all these, uh, these Hanuks or these, uh, these apartments as, a, as a, like a loggia or a colonnade uh, on the eastern side, connecting these students out to the, to the uh, community that surrounds them, and that the community could come and walk under the colonnade and become part of, this is the university set, set among the hills. So here we have a view of that colonnade where the, the general public could move along and join and maybe go to the cafe uh, in this uh, facility, which would be staffed by students being trained. And here is a view at this point in the plan. So the plan, there's a hillside. We tucked the, the bigger rooms against the shadowed hillside. We then move uh, the, the, uh, all the residential on the eastern side, and then we bridge across with the classrooms. So here you are on this level here, looking out around to the countryside into the central garden and seeing the bridges of the teaching above. So here we have the teaching bridges. There's, uh, you, you have the hanoks, which are positioned along the east, facing out towards the countryside. We have these teaching bridges, which link the living quarters to the uh, uh, sport and cultural um, uh, facilities within this uh, building. We link on to the rest of the campus and we are modified by the hills. So these are the surrounding hills and these are the classrooms which span between the two and form this space underneath it connecting to the campus itself. Here we have a student viewing, that person is standing here viewing down into the south facing garden which is in, in this position. And this view of this, the grand room if you like of this uh, um, residential uh, training uh, facility for these teenagers is the grand room is really the void for nature to come into the space with the teaching bridges uh, above. The last project which I'll uh, present uh, this morning is a very important uh, project for ourselves in the city where John and I are this morning. And it is, a, it is uh, the Dublin City Library. And working with architect Shaffrey, we are uh, working with uh, Dublin City Council, uh, where this part of the city has suffered huge deprivation uh, over the last uh, decades. And putting a library into this space will be uh, an unbelievably uh, important, <coughs> excuse me, aspect of uh, its gen regeneration, not just for cultural reasons, but for social uh, reasons. Libraries are incredible things. They're not quiet places where you're told to stay quiet. Librarians are probably one of the most radical uh, professions that we know. They're at the cutting edge of society. They know what libraries need to do. They value uh, culture. So this is really a part of Dublin. This map, it was a in, in the, the 1700s, uh, Dublin was unbelievably vibrant. And the, the, the space that we're dealing with is the top of this, um, uh, the, this square, uh, which has embedded in now, uh, and, and uh, it was a private home originally, but now it is, a, is a, uh, the, the Hugh Lane Gallery, a very beautiful um, art gallery embedded in the heart of this. So we have, the, our, uh, the competition was for uh, seven uh, Georgian houses. Georgian houses are these houses built in the in the 1700s, and these houses uh, are, uh, if you like, individually accessed normally. And this uh, competition was for five houses here, two houses here, and a new library. 
And what we did, we, our, uh, uh, if you like, entry was to transform the space in front of it, which is this, uh, this area here, which is where the road engineers have, uh, have been, uh, the, uh, you know, have, have made it really into a parking lot. And what we're uh, 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 proposing and which will happen is that this will be transformed. It's a raised space, it's facing south, uh, the, the Dublin mountains are down to the south here and the city is to the south. So essentially what we're doing is we're clearing out the interior, building contemporary within the interior and modifying the existing buildings uh, so that they, they are linked into the interior. We make a, a, a space in uh, uh, here, which is the, um, uh, a public space, which will be uh, transformed in terms of markets and, and, and gathering. So essentially you have the, uh, the upper uh, houses, each of them individual, these Georgian houses with very, very beautiful spaces. You have the centerpiece of the Hugh Lane Gallery. And what we're saying in section is that, yes, you modify and transform the uh, 18th century houses. You place a modern piece within, and this zenithal light allows us to make these, to separate and celebrate the back elevation of these uh, uh, 18th century houses to bring light into this space and to bring people up through uh, embedded gardens onto the roofs of this house and to view over the city and towards the gardens, uh, the uh, Parnell Square, which is here, but also to the, to the Dublin mountains. So this space, this democratic space, this library, uh, recently it, it was stalled for a while and luckily the government have supported it so this building is uh, hopefully we're moving now towards making this building in our city there is the back elevation of the existing 18th century buildings the roof up here these are the galleries uh, of, of the library moving up uh, in in circulation embedded landscapes uh, up to the uh, up to the uh, to, to the upper to the upper level and I just like to, to finish my, my section uh, with, with just saying how um, uh, that we have become acutely aware that what we do as architects affects all aspects of this planet. And we need to imagine ways of reusing and using our natural and man-made resources in responsible and inventive ways. As architects, we need to address the ongoing impact caused by wasteful consumption of energy and materials. We need optimistically to imagine a world where values are transformed and changed, leading to a different, more gentle way of occupying our planet. Architecture and, planet and planning are by nature optimistic because they're imagining a future. The earth is our client. We live on a beautiful planet between the ground and the sky. We all have a part to play. Thank you.